what up, what up, what up, what up, what up? What's good? What's up, people? I'm back. It's me, L Teddy27. And I'm back. And it's June. June 2020. And I know 2020 has been a horrific month for us. But I'm here to spread some good news, spread some information, spread some love. It's Pride Month. And I wanted to come to you all and talk a little bit about some people who we should be proud of during Pride Month. No. Uh, I'm a member of this spectrum, the LGBTQ plus spectrum, and I th I'm also black. And with everything that's going on, I thought it not robbery enough to spread the word, spread the wealth, and give some information to you all um, about some pioneers, some very important people, some people you should know that are black and authentically gay and have revolutionized this country and made this world a better place names you should know people who you should have in your wheelhouse of information in terms of black gay individuals so that's what we're doing here today we're celebrating who we are it's pride month and we are proud to be who we are so let's celebrate these individuals and i hope you enjoy it i hope you spread the wealth and share this with some people who may not have known these people or who you feel need to know these people. So let's get out there and let's um, celebrate. The first person we're going to celebrate is none other than one of the members of the Mount Rushmore of black gay individuals. His name is Bayard Rustin. Now Bayard Rustin was a civil rights leader he, and he was an activist. He was born way back in 1912, March 17th of 1912 in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Now he um, was openly gay from very early on, and that caused him um, to become to be in the background most of his life. He had expertise in nonviolence resistance, and he um, he had expertise in organizational skills, gathering large crowds of people, being able to protest in large groups, and be nonviolent. So much so that he became a key advisor to Martin Luther King in the 1950s as well as in the 60s, helping him organize all of the protests that he had. He was so well known amongst civil rights leaders that A. Philip Randolph, who is the person that um, created the March on Washington in 1963, asked him to organize the march. So he is the orchestrator and engineer of the March on Washington that we know all about where Martin Luther King, King gave the I Have a Dream speech. It is he that did it, but the problem is you don't hear a lot about him because of his orientation. Because Not only because he was black, but just because of being black and because he was open about his um, about being gay and he did not want to, want to hide that. And because of that, his notoriety and his fame did not come until well after the Civil Rights Movement. He, he walked in the shadows, organizing, leading, and putting everything together, never to really be known in his prime for what he did. It wasn't until well later into his life that he was known. But like I say, he was unapologetic. He was out when it was not cute to be out, okay? When people were not only just getting shunned, they were getting killed. Okay, it could cost you your life. So certainly, we have to celebrate Mr. Bayard Rustin because he was a pioneer in um, in the black gay community. Um, he would be on our Mount Rushmore. Another person who would be on our Mount Rushmore if we had one is Mr. James Baldwin, author and playwright. This revolutionary was born way back. <laughs> he was born on August 2nd of 1924 in Harlem in New York City. Um, he was a, he's an author, he's an essayist, he's a playwright, he's a novelist. He was the voice of the American Civil Rights Movement for the world. Whereas Martin Luther King was doing a lot of speaking and became the voice of the Civil Rights Movement here in America. He was doing that globally. So he was telling the world globally what was going on in America um, when a lot of blacks just weren't allowed to do so. Um, he is um, famous for his speeches and debates and his intellect. He was an intellectual. Um, after writing his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, he published his next novel, Giovanni's Room, which told the story of an American living in Paris. Um, but what was interesting about that, it was groundbreaking because it was about a black man who was living in Paris and was um, 
a homosexual, which at that time was very taboo at that time. And um, the first book I ever read of his uh, was Nobody Knows My Name. And I remember I, a teacher gave it to me. I, I was in eighth grade, and I remember reading it three times back to back. Like I read it, finished it. It was so good. I had to go back and read it again and read it and finished it. I had to go back and read it again. So I read it three times in one week because it was so good. I mean, he had a way of conveying a message that was, it, it, it just, it's, it pierced through to your soul. I mean, the eloquence, the intellect, the, 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 um, the syntax of what he would say. Oh man, it, 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 mm, I'm telling you, he had a way with words. Some of my favorite quotes by James Baldwin, who is one of my heroes. But James Baldwin, um, one of the, uh, one of his three quotes of his are my favorite. One says, "I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain." Yeah. Another one is, you think your pain is, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. <laughs> you see what I mean? And my favorite, the last one that's one of my favorite quotes of his is, people can cry much easier than they can change. Let that sink in. That's the great James Bond pioneer is um, in the world of dance Al Vanilli, dancer choreographer now Al Vanilli was born way back when he was born on January 5th 19, 1911 in Rogers Texas, he founded um, the Al Vanilli American Dance Theater um, he was a dancer, he was a choreographer he danced with the great his dance um, troupe at one time was so uh, well known and so um, revered that the United States, um, the U.S. State Department paid for them to go on tour during the early 60s at a time where you know, America was still racist and bigoted. Uh, but he was open about his um, sexuality and he was, he was unapologetically black, he was unapologetically gay. Um, he is arguably one of the most influential names in modern dance. A um, lot was made of his revolutionary show, um, Revelations, um, that changed the game in dance and changed everything people thought and knew about what dance could be and its impact on society and culture and the world. And it brought black urban um, dance to the world. And um, it was the Revelations. Um, uh, show was based on um, the black church and so forth so it allowed um, audiences around the world to see to get a glimpse into our culture at a time where they were rejecting our culture this is at a time where it wasn't cute for white people to listen to black music that's Alvin Ailey our next pioneer is none other than Elin Harris the E stands for Everett but he goes by E. Lynn Harris. Oh, man. I can't tell you what he did for me. E. Lynn Harris was born on June 20th of 1955 in Flint, Michigan. And he he's a he was a he was a best-selling author. Um, and he was a he was a beast in the literary world. He wrote 11 novels, 10 of which became New York Times bestsellers. Um, he introduced a lot of the black community to the world and to the stories of black gay men when a lot of people in the black populace was not, were not familiar with our stories, were not familiar with who we are. All they knew was the caricatures and the people that they saw every now and again. They saw the flamboyant, um, and the people who he had in his stories were not overly flamboyant. They were successful. Um, you know, they went to college. They were human and not caricatured. They had flaws. They, they had, you know, they had lust. They had, you know, they were happy. They were, they had 
everything that makes us human. And it brought to life the stories of individuals, of a whole segment of the population in the black community that was not told. And I remember being a teenager in the mid 90s. Damn it, I just told my age. But I remember being a teenager in the mid 90s and I remember picking up the novel Invisible Life, which was his first book. And it was well after it had been published. I think it was like 93 or 94 when I picked up Invisible Life. And I remember not wanting to put it down because it was so good, it was so good. But I remember I was afraid that people would see what the title of it and like the cover had like two guys on the front. So I was afraid that people would see it. So I went and got the newspaper and I used the newspaper as a book cover and I taped the newspaper over the cover of the novel because I didn't want to put it down, but I wanted to read it. I remember riding a bus to school and reading it and reading it and reading it and wouldn't put it down. And, um, being so afraid to have people see me reading this book, but it just was so great. It was such a great novel. And um, it probably skyrocketed in, into stardom with his second novel, Just As I Am, which at, when it came out, it did so well, it forced all of the other publisher, publishing companies, I should say, and publishers to acknowledge this segment of the population because it went stratospheric and they started looking for other authors that could authentically tell the story of black gays in America. And it was so needed at the time because all we knew was at that time, DL, 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 or overly flamboyant and that's all you knew. And there were no stories of people that weren't one of those two. So he is our other pioneer. I did have the pleasure of meeting him. Um, I believe it was 2008 when I met him. Um, and it was at a Pride event. It was at Miami Sizzle, which was a Pride event at the time. And he was there. He was signing books and things, things like that. And he signed and autographed his new book for me. And I just told him I was a writer and I wanted to, um, and, I, and I, that I taught writing and I wanted to sit down and talk to him. And so he said, well, uh, meet me at my room at such and such time. And we went up to his hotel room and we talked for about an hour and a half because he didn't have that long. But it was a conversation that really changed my life and it changed how I felt about my own writing and teaching writing. So I'm ever grateful to him. Um, unfortunately, he passed away um, in 2009. He's no longer with us. But that is Elin Harris, great American author. In that vein, our next pioneer is James Earl Hardy. James Earl Hardy is another author around the same time as Elin Harris. And if I could equate it to music, Elon Harris was voice to men. James Earl Hardy was Jodeci. <laughs> Good boys, bad boys. He was born in Brooklyn in um, 1966. And um, James Earl Hardy, he wrote um, stories. He wrote some of the first novels that told the stories of black gay hip hop. You know, it was black gay hip hop love stories. It read like great erotica. It was stories where the men were hard and they were masculine and they were the antithesis of everything and anything people thought was the black gay world. They were, you know, it explored that side of the spectrum where there's this machismo about them, where there's this masculinity. You know, he opened the world of erotica to he opened the world of lust and all of that and he made it cool and he made you want to you know read about it and talk about it um and it was like oh man um and this was during the era of the dl men where there was a real disdain for black gay men and so telling these stories at that time was kind of revolutionary um because he celebrated it as opposed to shutting it like it was at that time um his works um, were definitely celebrated um, because of the stories that they told. He also became a playwright and wrote several um, plays. One that was critically acclaimed and award-winning for him was a uh, play. I can't remember the name right now. I should have did more research. Darn it, old Teddy, 27. Anyway, it was a story I centered around the life of Tiger Tyson, who was actually, believe it or not, a straight man who performed in gay adult films. And it was an award-winning um, play for him that he wrote and directed. And it was, um, it was I actually saw it, um, and it was really, really good. 
But anyway, um, he is to be heralded because his novels let the world know that being black and gay didn't mean that you had to give up your masculinity. And we needed that. Um, and that is James Earl. The next pioneer is Mr. Keith Boykin. Keith Boykin is an author, journalist, political commentator, and a, a, a guy who is not lauded enough and isn't spoken of enough in the black gay community, but did tremendous things for us. He was born in 1965, August 28th of 1965, in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, um, Keith Boykin um, is Ivy League educated, went to Dartmouth, went to Harvard Law School. And while he was at Harvard Law School, he became the um, leader on the, diver on the campus diversity movement and general editor of the Harvard Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Law Review. Um, so he has his own resume unto his own. Um, he worked in the Dukakis um, campaign and he worked for the Clinton um, campaign in 1992 and after Clinton um, was inaugurated, he then became the special assistant to the president of the United States and director of specialty media for um, Bill Clinton. And then at, um, um, later on in Clinton's administration, he became what at that time was the highest ranking openly gay person in the White House um, at the time, openly gay um, in existence. And he helped organize and participated in the nation's first meeting between um, gay and lesbian leaders in the country and the United and a, and a United States president which was revolutionary there had never been a meeting of the leaders of the gay and lesbian movement and the leaders within the community and the US president and he um, organized that um, within his office in the White House with Bill Clinton so he was definitely revolutionary and isn't talked about enough for what he did for us and the movement he um, also wrote several um, books and novels um, telling the story of what it meant to be black and gay in America and what that felt like and um, I remember reading all of his novels and what they did for me and the stories that they told and what, what made it uh, reach reach me was it wasn't fiction this was real this was him crying out and speaking to what it meant to be in this country and be black but not only be black couple that with being gay at the same time and that was hard uh, he was the sole voice in the 90s in a um, in a White House where um, during that time um, the, the LGBTQ plus community leaders were Lily White, Lily White, and he was one of the one of the few voices in at that time in the um, LGBT plus um, movement that was black, unauthentically black, and spoke up for the rights. And he was on the um, front lines and fought for the rights of brown and black LGBTQ plus citizens in the White House, in Washington, D.C., moving legislation and letting it be known that we are here and we have to be, uh, we have to be seen, we have to be heard, and we have to be treated equally. You can see him now regularly on CNN or MSNBC or CNBC or BET. Um, you can see him doing political commentary um, all the time um, on those um, network cable um, cable network television shows. Um, he also teaches at Columbia University in New York. So he is um, a member of the intelligentsia. And um, a lot of times you don't hear stories of black gay men that are not just in the arts or not just in um, music and things like that or not just in you know adult film one who is educated a member of um, the political sphere a member of dare I say the black intelligentsia and unapologetic about his orientation that is Keith Boykin I've met him before um, and I sat down and had a conversation with him ironically enough I was at real quick 30 second story I was at um a club called The Palace that is the only openly gay club on the Miami Beach Strip on Ocean Drive. It's closed down now. I think they reopened it. Anyway, I met him there. I saw him there and I recognized him and I said, you're Keith Boykin. And he was like, oh God, 
who is this stalker? And I was like, you're Keith Morgan. And my friends were looking at me like, okay, they didn't know who he was. And I knew who he was. And the other people around him really didn't know who he was. And I was like, I got to take a picture with you. I got to take a picture with you because I knew who he was. And I wanted to celebrate that. And he, we talked for a little bit. And he said, you know, I'm so glad you recognized me because normally I never get recognized for anything. And I said, no, I know who you are. I appreciate you. I'm so glad um, to have met you in my life. And it was such a big deal for me. But I met him there. So that's my Keith Boykin story. That is Keith today. Our last pioneer is going to be Patrick Ian Polk. Patrick Ian Polk is a director, screenwriter, and producer. He is born um, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi back in July 29th of 1973. Um, he brought black gay men to television and films in a way that made it cool to be one of the girls. <laughs> but he brought our faces and our stories to not just the print media, but to visual media, to the silver screen, to the, to the big screen, to the small screen. He brought our faces and our stories to television and to film with films like Punks and The Skinny and Blackbird and Noah's Art Jumping the Brome. These films became the voice of the 21st century black gay man. When the television show Noah's Art came out, I cannot begin to tell you what it did for the community, the black gay community. There was nothing before it like it. There has been nothing after it that could come close to being what Noah's Ark was and is and means to the community. Let me tell you how influential Noah's Ark, that show was. While you had Harris, Elon Harris, and Hardy, James R. Hardy, that let the world into what it was to be black and gay via literature, he did that by putting us on screen. It's not a coincidence that when Noah's Ark exploded onto television, there was this huge explosion in the black community, in the black non-gay community, I should say, of the black gay lingo, the black gay culture, everything black and gay became popular at that time. That's not a coincidence. That is direct influence of shows like Noah's Ark that came on the scene and was letting the world see who we were, that was seeing our lingo, seeing our culture, seeing what we do. And it wasn't just that we were one of the girls. He brought us uh, characters that were entrepreneurs and that were masculine and characters that were college professors and that were getting married and that were having children and that were traveling the country and that were firefighters and that were doing things that people didn't think that we did. That was giving us a life and giving us a voice and giving us a place in society that just wasn't, hey girl, hey, but making us real tangible, productive members of American culture. We weren't caricatures anymore. We were typical members of society. And that's, and we have to applaud Patrick Ian Pope and what he brought to um, to the world by showing us and giving our stories to the world and showing that we were more than just ballroom. Not that there's anything wrong with ballroom, but people equate our stories with just that being overly flamboyant or just, you know, being in the arts and dance and ballroom and design. And we're more than that. And I'm so thankful that he told our stories, our stories of how we love each other and our stories of how we're friends and the camaraderie and the family that we have amongst each other. That's what he brought to the world. And um, I'm grateful for Patrick Ian Polk. I've never met him before. I've seen him in passing, um, but I've never, you know, spoken to him and met him before. Um, so I'm so grateful for the last one. And those are our pioneers. These are men who need to be celebrated. These are men who we need to know. We need to speak their names. Um, this isn't the last installment of this I'm going to do this month. I am going to do another one and bring more of these black gay men to you. But I thought it important that as a black gay man during Pride Month, I bring you the names and stories of people who we have to know, who we have to celebrate, who we have to speak their name, and who the next generation, if one young black gay boy 
sees this video and knows that oh we do have a history and we do have a story and there that we have been around all the time then that's impactful to me because someone someone needs to hear this and someone needs to know this i challenge and i tag anybody watching this if you're an ally if you are in the spectrum i challenge you to make your own videos celebrating members of the spectrum that are authentically black and authentically and are authentically a part of the spectrum be the lgbtq plus or all the other letters all right so that is my challenge to all of you i hope that you accept the challenge i will be making more of these videos this month but that's all i got for y'all i hope you like until next time i'm l teddy 27 and i will be here for you all next time that's all i got thank y'all for coming y'all drive safely